Throughout history, the genteel nature of women has been demonstrated to discount the psychopathic nature of some crimes that appeared perpetrated by the gentler sex. However, that same history documents that the gentler sex can be more cunning, more brutal, and less remorseful for their crimes. True Crime Man's Dark Imagination presents two episodes portraying some of the worst of history's female assailants. The motives appeared to be similar, greed of some sort, but lives appeared to have been sacrificed so that these women could enjoy a more comfortable existence, and utilizing their feminine guiles proved not only deadly, but in the end demonstrated that crime indeed pays well, at least for a short time. March 24, 1873, a woman sentenced to death made her way to the gallows at Durham Prison in Great Britain. Because the executioner did not set the knot correctly behind the left or right ear, rather setting the knot straight behind the neck, when the executioner pulled the lever releasing the trap door, the woman dangled, strangling to death before finally expiring. Some witnessing the event wanted the woman to suffer more than she did before her demise. Others believed she got exactly what the court determined. Who was this woman that some wanted to leave this earth in an excruciating way? Were her crimes so brazen, dastardly brutal or despicable that she deserved to die in the way prescribed by the court at her trial? The woman hanged that cool March day was born Mary Ann Robeson in 1832 in the small village of Low Moorsley in Tyne and Ware, Northern England. Her father was a miner who died when she was eight, and Mary and her brother were raised by her mother who was impoverished after the loss of her husband. Mary's mother later remarried and Mary is said to have loathed her stepfather. In 1852, at the age of 20, Marianne married colliery laborer William Mowbray in the Newcastle upon Time Register office. They moved soon to Plymouth, Devon. The couple had five children, four of whom died from gastric fever. William and Marianne moved back to Northeast England where they had lost three more children. William became a foreman in South Hetton Colliery and then a fireman aboard a steam vessel. He died of an intestinal disorder in January, 1865. William's life was insured by the British and Prudential Insurance Office, and Mary Ann collected a payout of 35 pounds on his death, equivalent to about a half year wages for a manual laborer at the time. Soon after Mowbray's death, Mary Ann moved to Seaham Harbor, County Durham, where she struck up a relationship with Joseph Natras. He, however, was engaged to another woman, and she left Seaham after Natras's wedding. During this time, Mary's three-and-a-half-year-old daughter died, leaving her with one child out of the nine she had born. She returned to Sunderland and took up employment at the Sunderland Infirmary, House for Recovery for the Cure of Contagious Fever, Dispensary and Humane Society. She sent her remaining child, Isabella, to live with her mother. One of her patients at the infirmary was an engineer, George Ward. They married in Monkwearmouth on 28 August, 1865. He continued to suffer of ill health, and he died October 1866 after a long illness characterized by paralysis and intestinal problems. 
The attending doctor later gave evidence that Ward had been seriously ill, yet he had been surprised that the man's death was so sudden. Once again, Marianne collected insurance money from her husband's death. James Robinson was a shipwright at Pallion Sunderland, whose wife Hannah had died recently. He hired Marianne as a housekeeper in November 1866. One month later, when James's baby died of gastric fever, he turned to his housekeeper for comfort, and she became pregnant. Then Marianne's mother, living in Seam Harbor, County Durham, became ill, so she immediately went to her. Although her mother started getting better, she also began to complain of stomach pains. She died at age 54 in the spring of 1867, nine days after Marianne's arrival. Marianne's daughter, Isabella, from the marriage to William Mowbray, was brought back to the Robinson household and soon developed bad stomach pains and died. So did another two of Robinson's children. All three children were buried in the last two weeks of April, 1867. Robinson married Marianne at St. Michael's on 11th, August, 1867. Their child, Mary Isabella, was born that November, but she became ill with stomach pains and died in March, 1868. Robinson, meanwhile, had become suspicious of his wife's insistence that he ensure his life. He discovered that she run up debts of 60 pounds behind his back and had stolen more than 50 pounds that she was supposed to have put in the bank. The last straw was when he found that she had been forcing his children to pawn household valuables for her. He threw her out. Marianne was desperate and living on the streets. Then her friend Margaret Cotton introduced her to her brother, Frederick, a pitman and recent widower living in Walbottle, Northumberland who had lost two of his four children. Margaret had acted as a substitute mother for the remaining children, Frederick Jr. and Charles. But in late March 1870, Margaret died from an undetermined stomach ailment, leaving Marianne to console the grieving Frederick Sr. Soon, her 11th pregnancy was underway. Frederick and Marianne were bigamously married on the 17th of September, 1870, at St. Andrew's Newcastle upon Tyne, and their son Robert was born early in 1871. Soon after, Marianne learned that her former lover, Joseph Natras, was living in the nearby village of West Auckland and no longer married. She rekindled the romance and persuaded her new family to move near him. Frederick followed his predecessors to the grave in December of that year from gastric fever. Insurance had been taken out in his life and the lives of his sons. After Frederick's death, Natra soon became Mary Ann's lodger. She gained employment as a nurse to an excise officer recovering from smallpox, John Quick Manning. Soon she became pregnant by him with her twelfth child. Frederick Jr. died in March 1872 and the infant Robert soon after. The Natras became ill with gastric fever and died, just after revising his will in Marianne's favor. The insurance policy Mary had taken out on Charles's life still waited collection. Mary Ann's downfall came when she was asked by a parish official, Thomas Riley, to help nurse a woman who was ill with smallpox. She complained that the last surviving cotton boy, Charles Edward, was in the way and asked Riley if he could be committed to the workhouse. Riley also served as West Auckland's assistant coroner, said she would have to accompany him. She told Riley that the boy was sickly and added, I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the Cottons. Five days later, when Mary Ann told Riley that the boy had died, Riley went to the village police and convinced the doctor to delay writing a death certificate until the circumstances could be investigated. Mary Ann's first port of call after Charles's death was not the doctor's office, but the insurance office. There she discovered that no money would be paid out until a death certificate was issued. An inquest was held and the jury returned a verdict of natural causes. 
Marianne claimed to have used arrowroot to relieve his illness and said Riley had made accusations against her because she had rejected his advances. Then the local newspapers latched onto the story and discovered Marianne had moved around northern England and lost three husbands, a lover, a friend, her mother, and a dozen children, all of whom have died of stomach fevers. At approximately 12 p.m. on the afternoon of Friday, April 11, 1947, prison officials at San Quentin State Penitentiary in California opened the cell where a condemned inmate who arrived from the California Women's Correctional Institute the day before. The 64-year-old woman walked without the binds of shackles as a woman chaplain led her down the long, morose, cold hallway to her final destination on Earth. She took her place in the iron chair inside the airproof cylinder as Warden Clinton Duffy read the final warrant for execution. Just as the escorting guards left the chamber, they gave the signal to commence the execution. The cylinder hatch shut with a deafening thud and the quote-unquote dogs spun without any sound whatsoever. Three minutes passed. The condemned woman's face seemed solemn and the wear appeared beyond her years. A window in the top third of the chamber door allowed the condemned to look at the 60 spectators who petitioned the prison to see her final moments. Before the final actions of the executioner, the matronly woman gave the warden a small smile. Although for the last few years she had vehemently proclaimed her innocence, her cries silenced as she waited for the clink of the tablets to hit the acid beneath her cold steel chair. At 12.13 p.m., after a last spasmodic breath, her head dropped to her breast and the silent message of her death was carried through a stethoscope over her heart to prison doctor W.H. Edwards. She went to her death in a beautiful pink dress with bright flowers that she wore to her last trial where the jury pronounced her guilty of cold-blooded murder, sentencing her to death. The prisoner executed on that spring day in 1947 signified an end to more than 25 years of psychopathy that included theft, fraud, swindles, and finally, murder surrounding every decision she made in life. Lafie Louise Presler, a small-town girl from Bienville, Louisiana, sought wealth and pleasure from the seediest of proclivities. Her pursuit of the most flesh-filled entertainments culminated in the ultimate price for her desires. But more than that, Presler saw enjoyment in the suffering of others, especially in their demise. Lafie Louise Presler, known as Louise for the rest of her life, was born to a family of privilege on September 20, 1880, in Bienville, Louisiana, a small village in the parish of Bienville in the northwestern quadrant of the state. Louise's father, a wealthy newspaper publisher, ensured that his children had all of the modern conveniences and she attended an exclusive private boarding school in New Orleans. While attending this school, Louise pushed the limits of decorum and the mores of the time. In attending this private institution, the headmaster expelled the 15-year-old girl for offenses that could only be described as stealing from her classmates and engaging in promiscuous behavior. This type of promiscuous behavior defined Louise the remainder of her life and she continued having sex for money in the small hamlets and towns throughout Louisiana for the next eight years. Then, in 1903, Louise married Henry Bosley, a young traveling salesman. Bosley worshipped Louise dearly, and while on a trip home in 1905 to surprise his wife, he inadvertently discovered her in bed having sexual relations with another man. Bosley left Louise, and after two years and during a severe bout of depression, he killed himself. After Bosley's death, Louise moved to Shreveport, Louisiana, where she plied her skills as a high-class prostitute. Louise actually made more money in this vocation as she often relieved her customers not only for the cost of her services, but any money in their pockets at the time of their encounter with the young beauty. 
Seeing that her modus operandi seemed to be wearing thin in the northern Louisiana metropolis, Louise sought greener pastures and more money. In 1911, Louise moved to Boston, Massachusetts and changed her name to Louise M. Gold. Later, she began passing herself off as an heiress from Dallas, Texas named R.H. Rosley. As a fake heiress, Louise conned her way into several lavish Boston area homes. One family believed the story that she told of being locked away into a covent from where she escaped. One particular family took her into their home where she began to shop for expensive items at a local department store and having the bill sent to the patriarch of the family where merchants demanded payment almost immediately. Additionally, she absconded with money and valuables from the homes of the family's friends. In order to avoid any embarrassment, once police discovered her true identity, authorities allowed her to leave the city without incident. Louise then traveled to Waco, Texas, and soon thereafter, the police found the body of a young man on the side of the road. When questioned about the incident, Louise simply stated that the man attempted to rape her and she killed him in self-defense. Strangely, the unidentified man appeared to be missing all of his valuables and jewelry. When questioned about the man's belongings, Louise used her charm and convinced the police that someone must have happened along and stole them after she left the man there. Police had no evidence to link Louise to the murder and released her. In 1912, Louise met and wooed millionaire Joe Apple. Only a week after meeting the oil tycoon, police found Apple dead from a single gunshot wound in his residence. Authorities also learned that a diamond ring belonging to the victim was missing. Immediately, those in Waco society pointed the finger directly towards Louise. Authorities charged her with murder, but a grand jury refused to indict Louise and instead believed her story that Apple attempted to rape her and she shot him in self-defense. In 1913, Louise left Waco and made her way to Dallas, Texas, and immediately cohabitated and then married Harry Farrat, a local night clerk of an extravagant St. George Hotel. Louise, always prepared to utilize her paramour charms, stole $20,000 worth of jewelry from the hotel's safe when she coerced the combination from Farrat. Law enforcement again questioned Louise about the missing jewelry, but possessed no evidence she stole the valuables. In true Louise fashion, leaving trails of barren hearts wherever she traveled, Louise left Farrat and he later shot himself. Police ruled the death a suicide. Upon leaving Dallas after the St. George Hotel robbery and her quote-unquote vindication, Louise traveled to Denver, Colorado, and in February of 1915, met Richard Cola Pete, secretary of the Auto Trade Association. After taking their honeymoon, Richard and Louise went on a short honeymoon through Colorado and then settled in Denver. The couple welcomed a child the following year, but Louise grew restless. In 1916, the new mother abandoned her husband and young daughter and moved to Los Angeles, California, where, even without a divorce, she sought the comfort of money and a new husband. In 1920, Louise met and again wooed another rich man, Jacob C. Denton, who recently lost his wife and had a teenage daughter. Denton made millions as a mining engineer before he retired. Denton met Louise when she inquired about the 14-room mansion near Wilshire Boulevard that Denton hoped to rent out while he left town to inspect some of his business interests. Denton asked that anyone wanting to rent the mansion must pay $350 per month. But for some reason, Denton agreed to only charge Louise $75 per month. Historians have questioned the true nature of the relationship between Louise and Denton, some observers at the time stated that Louise and Denton became romantically involved, a claim that Louise made later, but no confirmation of this fact ever materialized. On or about June 2, 1920, Denton disappeared, never to be seen again. When questioned about his whereabouts, Louise stated that Denton received a gunshot to the arm and he felt embarrassed because of the wound. Another excuse she gave for Denton's absence became that he not only suffered the gunshot wound, but he had the arm amputated after a botched operation to repair the bullet's damage. Some whispered that Denton left the area and disappeared somewhere in the Midwest to conceal his affairs from his family and acquaintances. To add more suspicion to her claims, Louise averred that Denton gave her a bill of sale for his automobile, gave her permission to open his mail, and finally gave her permission to sell his house and accept the first payment thereof. During the course of the months leading to intense suspicion, Louise carried everyday business dealings in Denton's name, suspicious transactions when considering that 
Denton's 16-year-old daughter, Frances, grew fearful of the young house guest with all the powers of attorney, including the managing of the retiree's money. Finally, after listening to the continuing excuses Louise preferred to inquisitive friends and relatives, police decided to search Denton's 14-room mansion for any sign of the millionaire. On September 23, 1920, police searched the Denton residence and noticed a walled-off section of the basement. When authorities broke through, they found the decomposing body of Jacob Denton under three tons of loose dirt. Louise, as her custom dictated, began waving tales of preposterousness and even brought forth a possible suspect, the Spanish woman. While visiting Denver, Louise stated that Denton allowed her access to all of his property, including, but not limited to, his automobile and use of his spacious mansion without paying any rent whatsoever. Louise averred that she gave up the house to return to Denver to take care of her husband and the first she heard of Denton's death occurred while taking care of her invalid husband. Again, Louise spun the yarn of a Spanish woman whom she claimed had a key to the house and came here frequently. I felt uneasy for during my absence from the house on several occasions, I found evidence that someone had been at the house while I was away. To deflect any suspicion that Louise executed a murder and cover-up, thus further confusing any investigative progress, she stated that she received a letter from Denton on September 17th from New York. Secondly, checks Denton wrote were deposited in the Farmers and Merchants National Bank as recently as June 16th, 14 days after Denton's alleged disappearance. Finally, Denton allegedly deposited a check in the amount of $1,000 at the same bank on June 1st. Close relatives to the now deceased millionaire stated that they saw him last on May 29th. Other than the evidence Louise presented to authorities, no other evidence existed to prove Denton remained alive after June 2nd. Detective Charles Jones stated that if Louise produced the letter she claimed to receive from Denton, then the body found in the house must belong to someone else. In investigating the case, police understood that the claims Louise made needed substantiation in order to clear her from the suspect list. Furthermore, her story seemed to crumble with the police investigating her associations with persons she engaged for renovations to the mansion. James W. Crowhurst, a handyman, admitted to police during a lengthy questioning that Louise hired him to build the tomb in the basement and that after Crowhurst finished building the basement, he would wait until Louise notified him to fill the remainder of the basement with loose earth. Police later discovered that Crowhurst had served time in Folsom Prison for robbery in 1905. Crowhurst stated, in no uncertain terms, that Louise hired him to make repairs to the mansion, which included nailing the wooden compartment where Denton's body was found. Police did not immediately arrest Crowhurst, but held him until they convened a grand jury. Because of the mysterious circumstances that pervade throughout the beginning of the Denton investigation, the media dubbed Louise the Enigma Woman, mostly due to Louise as she appeared as the clandestine player in the whole Denton mystery. No one thought right away to examine whether Louise had a criminal history or question about her past. Captain Ainsley C. Armstrong of the Boston Police Department related to a reporter from the Boston Post that Louise Pete came to Boston in 1911 as Louise M. Gould and duped many of Boston's wealthiest and most prominent people several of the city's leading merchants, and a fashionable and exclusive black-based girls' school. Also, while in Boston, Louise claimed that she owned several properties around the world, including Germany and Norway. Captain Armstrong conducted the investigation into the accusations against Louise himself, and after a detailed and grueling interrogation, rather than pressing any charges and suffering the indignities of being conned, local authorities, under the pressure from Louise's victims, forced her to leave Boston. With her pedigree suspected and her past crimes already tried in the press, Louise had to testify before the coroner's inquest to further alleviate any further aspersions as to her guilt. On October 9, 1920, the County of Los Angeles, under the auspices of Assistant District Attorney William C. Duran, the coroner's inquest commenced in earnest to discover the cause of death of Jacob Denton. Law enforcement officials secreted Louise back to Los Angeles for the proceedings, suspecting that she would attempt to flee from Denver, where she resided, allegedly to care for her tubercular husband, Richard Pete. When she arrived for the inquest, her attorney, the former Judge O.N. Hilton, 
stated empathetically that either her client needed to be released or charged immediately. A chemistry professor, Arthur Mass, engaged for examination of Denton's organs indicated that no poison existed in the deceased's organs, dispelling the initial supposition that Denton died as a result of some fast-acting corrosive. Dr. Arthur Webb, the coroner, averred that Denton died as a result of strangulation by unknown causes, but could not determine an exact time of death. During the inquest, ADA Duran stated that Luis related to him that she heard from Denton on June 2nd, but no corroboration existed to substantiate her claim. Luis consistently mentioned the Spanish woman and maintained the stranger's culpability for Denton's death. Luis steadfastly claimed that Denton shot the woman in the shoulder and she retaliated by murdering the mining millionaire. Luis also added to her story that the Spanish woman called a male friend to the house and buried Denton's body in the basement. On October 25th, 1920, Luis failed to appear before the grand jury investigating Jacob C. Denton's murder. Newspaper reports abound that Luis fled and her return seemed unlikely. On the following day, Luis allegedly contacted the Los Angeles County District Attorney Thomas Woolwine to make sure the authorities held her above suspicion in Denton's murder. Without exposing their theory of the case, the District Attorney hoped to lure Luis in to her arrest. D.A. Woolwine and ADA Duran accomplished that on the next day when they specifically searched for the wayward Enigma woman. Police subsequently arrested Luis in connection with the murder of Jacob Denton. On the night of October 26, 1920, Luis Presler Pete called before the court to answer charges against her for the murder of Jacob C. Denton, responded with a resounding, not guilty. Meanwhile, authorities made more discoveries that shed light on the intricacies of the case. In every murder investigation, the method of inquiry must question which person may be a suspect appeared to have the most to gain with the victim's death. In the instant case, investigators did not have to look far. On October 27, 1920, letters of administration filed by the administrator of Denton's will, Judge Russ Avery, petitioned the court to open succession for the deceased's estate. Only one heir, Frances Denton, the 16-year-old daughter of the decedent, stood to inherit not only any real property, but cash. Luis's name failed to appear throughout the document. If Luis's plan sustained for her to inherit the fortune herself, this is one instance when she failed to execute her plan properly. Even though Luis stood to lose her life if convicted, she seemed unbothered by the charges or the anticipation of a murder trial. Louise's past certainly played a part in the ability of the citizenry of California to determine her guilt. The longer she stayed in jail, the more details of her life as a prostitute, confidence trickster, and Jezebel came to light. Newspapers clamored for more news about the Enigma woman and printed every syllable as newsrooms around the country received even the smallest morsel of information regarding Louise. Her trial led from Louisiana to Boston to Texas and parts in between where she swindled, connived, and almost certainly committed the ultimate crimes to ensure her financial security. Not to mention that some men along the way most assuredly cared for her, yet heartbroken one way or another as they discovered Luis's true character. On November 3rd, 1920, Jacob C. Denton was laid to rest in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery beside his beloved first wife, Mrs. Dolly Winters Denton. In attendance were his ex-wife, Mrs. Sarah Denton, and 16-year-old Frances Denton. The plot saw no overwhelming evidence of flowers sent in sympathy. Instead, a suitor sent Luis a bouquet of Christmas berries as a token of affection. While she sat on the cold steel bunk in her cell, Luis never reflected on her past felonious acts and mistreatment towards her paramours. Rather, she concentrated on an acquittal to resume her career of swindling and never showed any remorse. Los Angeles County District Court set Luis's trial to commence on November 29, 1920. The district attorney felt highly confident the evidence gathered through law enforcement proved overwhelmingly that Luis murdered Jacob C. Denton. She procured the earth underneath where police officers discovered Denton's body. She possessed pawn tickets for a ring belonging to the deceased disposed of his automobile, gave away some of his clothing, 
and cash checks bearing the signature of J.C. Denton after it was believed that he had been murdered. Louise's new attorney, she had three before finally hiring one who took the case, Walter J. Wood, a superior judge-elect and respected jurist, stated that the Spanish woman whom Louise claimed quarreled with Denton prior to his death figured prominently in her defense. Attorney Wood, employed by the public defender's office, took Louise's defense as she claimed financially ill-prepared to engage a high-powered lawyer for her defense. Because the trial received another continuance and Attorney Woods would take his superior court seat at the time of the trial, another replacement at the defense seemed prudent. Two assistants in the public defender's office, W.T. Aguilar and Robert H. Scott, assumed the duties vacated by Wood. Newly appointed judge Frank R. Willis granted a continuance for the people of California versus Louise Pete until January for the two sides to properly prepare for the proceedings. In fact, once the new year peaked over the end of December, Judge Willis nailed down January 19, 1921 as the trial start date. Authorities conducted a more in-depth search of the Denton's residence and uncovered a small caliber handgun found in a tin of baking powder near the crypt where authorities discovered Denton's decomposing body. According to reports, the weapon, a small revolver that would normally be carried by a female, contained five discharged and one undischarged cartridge and on it were stains, apparently blood. Dr. Webb asserted in his inquest testimony that Denton had died as a result of strangulation and not a gunshot wound. The discovery of the revolver and the blood certainly prompted the coroner to re-examine the autopsy report as well as attempt to exhume Denton's body to further analyze if any gunshot wounds existed on the corpse. The discovery of a canceled check also assisted law enforcement with identifying a young woman who allegedly worked for Louise at the time of Denton's disappearance. Opposing counsels grew anxious to locate and then interview Mrs. Catherine Morris, a housekeeper, as to the conditions present at the Denton's household prior to his disappearance. Other physical evidence surfaced that links Denton to his car and the fact that Louise fraudulently stole and then sold it. In the trunk of the vehicle, law enforcement found a pair of trousers that matched the coat that Denton wore at the time of his disappearance. The trousers contained vast amounts of blood spatter and certainly hinted that Louise had something more than just a passing responsibility in murdering Denton. Louise held the key to the lock of the trunk where police found the trousers. With the evidence mounting against Louise, many believed that perhaps she would throw herself upon the mercy of the court and declare herself insane or not capable of committing such a crime. In a statement to the press on January 6, 1921, Louise stated that, I have no intention of changing counsel, and I did not kill Jacob C. Denton. My defense will not be insanity. I am innocent. The mere suggestion that Louise contemplated a change in legal counsel and then declare herself to be mentally unfit now and at the time of the murder enraged the young woman to the point of lashing out at the public. In fact, Louise became so incensed that she emphatically declared that she planned to testify in her own behalf at trial. Most prosecuting attorneys see a defendant testifying as a gift, opening the witness to a steady stream of questioning bombardment. With an accused killer on the stand, many opportunities for the prosecution to jar any untruths loose present themselves fervently. However, with the type of scoundrel that Louise proved herself capable, the district attorney of the Los Angeles County saw a difficult fight ahead of him. Even though Louise gained a reputation for her toxic behavior in relationships in the past, while awaiting to stand trial for Denton's murder, two former sweethearts came forward to pledge not only their undying love, but also generously financed her defense. Both of the men, one a broker from New York, pledged almost $25,000 each for her defense. Despite the mounting evidence against her and the increasing belief that Louise, in fact, murdered Jacob Denton, demonstrated the guiles she displayed in her attempt for freedom. Only a jury would decide if those guiles could influence an acquittal. Louise hoped that perhaps she may have some sort of spell over the jury once chosen. Anticipation for the trial quickly peaked as January 19th drew closer. After the composition of the jury took their seats in the jury box, the trial began in earnest. The prosecution announced at the beginning of the proceedings their intention to seek the death penalty against Louise for the murder of Jacob C. Denton. After this announcement, Louise's demeanor changed to a more somber appearance. In the opening statement to the court, 
district attorney Woolwine proclaimed that Louise masqueraded as Denton's wife and purchased $600 worth of gowns at a Los Angeles department store after the murder. Louise's act of defiance and expression slowly degraded to a maddening scowl. Defense attorney Aguilar countered the prosecution's assertions by stating that Louise's stature inhibited her from not only carrying out the murder, but in dragging the lifeless body of Jacob Denton to its final resting place beneath the basement. At the moment when D.A. Woolwine brandished the evidence in the jury's view, Louise wavered and squirmed, visibly shaken, moved back and forth in her seat at the defense table. In some instances, she presented a venomous grimace toward the district attorney with energetic visual daggers. Upon the testimony of Denton's nephew, Paul Aument, he related to Luis's incessant queries regarding the use of quicklime to accelerate decomposition of dead bodies. It appeared that the jury and the gallery alike held their gasps until D.A. Woolwine produced the revolver for Mr. Aument to identify it as belonging to his uncle. Louise sat stoically as she appeared unworried after Amen's testimony. Amen strongly emphasized that Louise's interest in the quicklime seemed almost fanatical and thought it extremely odd and apparently psychopathic. Assistant Coroner Dr. H. L. White then testified that he discovered fragments of lead in the bones of Denton's neck, therefore causing the prosecution to inevitably change the cause of death from strangulation to one gunshot wound. The prosecution continued to hammer Luis's fabrications to the point where her confidence in an acquittal quickly dwindled. On February 5th, the case went to the jury for consideration and D.A. Woolwine stressed that the prosecution sought the death penalty should Luis stand convicted. In the late afternoon of February 6th, 1921, after a six-hour deliberation, the jury returned a guilty of murder in the first degree with a recommendation for life imprisonment. It appeared that Luis narrowly escaped the noose. Attorney Aguilar polled the jury and learned that 10 voted for conviction and 2 for acquittal. When the foreman announced the verdict in the last proceedings, Luis's husband, R.C.P., burst into tears. Luis then shook the hands of her attorneys, W.T. Aguilar and Robert H. Scott, turned to the bailiff and said, we'll go now. The bailiff and two deputies from Los Angeles County escorted the convicted murderer back to her jail cell. Louise exhibited no emotion both through the reading of the verdict, thanking her attorneys, and when walking back to the jailhouse. Judge Willis announced that he would sentence Louise on February 8th. Defense attorneys immediately motioned before the court their intention of filing a motion for a new trial. After the trial and the hoopla calmed down, Louise made a short statement to the media. She stated that the guilty verdict bestowed by the jury was no surprise to the defendant. Three days before the trial closed, I knew the jury was against me. I felt it, but I did not expect the jurors to make the sentence so drastic, Louise lamented. By November of 1921, the California Supreme Court denied Louise's appeal and therefore she began serving her life sentence for the murder of Jacob Denton. Although they carried out their plans with the emotion of self-preservation and enrichment, there were other ways which would not have seen their untimely demises. Murder can be portrayed through this story as a means to an end. However, in the many stories that we have covered on this channel, it seems that their critical thinking skills were lacking as murdering another human being sprung from many potential scenarios and diplomacy and patience was not one of them. For Mary Cotton, the bitter pill of poverty certainly provided a very weak justification for the crime she committed without remorse. Murdering husbands, lovers, and children seemed second nature to her, and the lack of a conscience made the dastardly deeds more palatable to the psychopath, especially when considering that she senselessly did away with her own flesh and blood for her own gain. In this case, I believe everyone can agree. The punishment fit the crime. In the case of Louise Pete, well, the question still remains, will she or did she ever learn her lesson? Although she protested her innocence, did she ever exhibit remorse once proven she was a murderer? 
We'll have to see when we present part two of this episode. For our subscribers and for anyone viewing this episode, we are on Rumble, Facebook, and Twitter. If you would like to support our channel, we can be found on PayPal, Buy Me a Cup of Coffee, and now at GoFundMe, and we'll put the links below. Until next time.